Welcome to the XP Team USA podcast. We're digging the plugs and pinpointing the topics you want to hear. And now, here's your hosts, Dave Kimball and Grant Hansen. This show is brought to you by XP Metal Detectors. XP Metal Detectors is a high-end, innovative metal detector company with great machines and great pinpointers. For more information, go to xpmetaldetectors.com. For a dealer near you, try a Google search or go to xpdeus-usa.com. Hello and welcome to the XP Team USA podcast. I'm your host, Dave Kimball, coming to you from central Oklahoma. And I am joined today by my co-host, Grant Hansen, coming to you from New Jersey. How are you doing, Grant? I am doing very well. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing pretty good. Weather's looking good today. It's raining off and on still now and then, but it's dry right now. Yeah, the weather is getting pretty good for us, too. I actually managed to get out a couple times. Didn't find anything fantastic, but uh, I just landed a few more permissions. So I'm optimistic to see what the next few weeks hold for me. I envy you. I have not been able to get out lately. I've been pretty busy with uh, working and, and other stuff. I thought I would have more time while working, but it seems like I have a bad habit of filling my plate too full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same way. You know, if it's not work, it's my daughter and her activities. Um, so when I have gotten out, it's probably only been for about two, two and a half hours in each clip. But it's still nice. But it's and it's still kind of a, a little demoralizing when you're on really old properties and just not finding anything. Yeah, it always sucks. You 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 could swear you you know there's something there, and it just like you know it's a piece of metal. No, that's a piece of the tin. No, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I um. A new permission I got was a very small yard, but the house was built in 1739. So I said, all right, this is going to be awesome. And I started digging Coke cans at like 10 inches. Uh, and I said, oh, this, this, unfortunately, it's been filled and leveled. And mm -hmm. I managed to flat button, but that's it. Yeah, I, I got out to an old school here in Oklahoma City, and uh, it, they were doing a bunch of work on the back of it. They just got to stripping like probably six inches or more of dirt off the top soil and looked like they were getting ready to do some construction on there. So I jumped out there. I I eyeballed it right when they were doing it, but the kids were still at the school, so I was waiting for school to get out. I and mean, I finally got a chance to get out there Saturday, and I got out there and looked like somebody was just out there, like I just missed them. I got out there around noon, and there was plugs everywhere, and these people were whoever was out there was just throwing their trash off to the side of the holes everywhere and it was <laughs> it's kind of disheartening to see that but yeah i didn't find it. i found a couple of weedies out there and, and stuff i didn't really find anything good but uh i i didn't stay very long yeah i hate seeing when people do that i've ran into that a few times around here and people there's somebody around here is just doesn't like to maybe they don't own a pouch or something i don't know what it is but they just throw their trash off to the side and it just really aggravates me yeah that, that that's so frustrating it drives me crazy because it's it's just a sign of laziness there's no reason they can't take it along with exactly them. if you're too lazy to pick up your trash and take it with you then find another hobby because this hobby exactly. is not for you agreed so we got uh, some new YouTube videos out. Yeah, we've got one uh, new one from Gary Blackwell. Very interesting um, on how to use the ORX on wet sand. So I think a lot of people are going to be interested in that because they'll they'll want to see the inside tips on you know how to handle that environment. Yeah, that is pretty interesting. And also the Minnesota Beach Boys got a new one called Excellent Adventures in North Dakota. Yeah, they went out and visited an organized dig and had some fun and talked to some great people. So that's that's a really good video to check out. And we also got a uh, new feature coming out pretty soon in YouTube. Uh, so check it out, the XP Team USA on YouTube. It's, it's some of the best content out there. I'm really looking forward to it. The guys do an amazing job of editing that. So um, I'm sure we'll be broadcasting uh, notices all over the place once it's live. Yeah. All right. And today we're going to be talking to Lenny Quaylen. 
as many of y'all know, uh, me and Lenny were the original host on the show. And now we finally get to get Lenny on and talk to him about, about Lenny. Yeah, I was actually a guest when you guys were hosting. So it's going to be fun to turn the tables and start asking him some of the hard questions. Yeah, so we'll be right back with Lenny. If you have a question for one of our guests or just like to make a comment, Call us at our XP Team USA podcast hotline at 405-294-3602. If you are needing the highest quality digging tool for metal detecting, then check out Predator Tools. Their digging tools are made from Chromoly 4130 and heat treated and tempered to ensure the highest quality product. Predator tools are made in the USA and are also used in the United States military. All of the tools carry a five-year warranty and are proven to be the toughest out there. So check out Predator Tools at PredatorTools.com. We'd like to welcome Lenny Quaylen to the show. You may know Lenny from his many appearances in XP Team USA feature episodes and from his Facebook live feeds. He is an XP Team USA member from the beautiful Iowa and also one of the original hosts of our podcast. Welcome to the show, Lenny. Yeah, hi, David. Hi, uh, Grant. Hey, Lenny. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, We got some intel from your detecting buddy, RC, so we'll have some fun questions for you in a bit. But first, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started detecting? Oh, boy, that could be a long answer. (laughs) Um, well, it, uh, I was, I played real hard when I was young, um, a lot of sports all through high school. Um, I was a pitcher in high school, uh, a lot of damage on my body, um, four knee surgeries, elbow surgeries, shoulder, uh, clean outs a few times. And, um, I kind of went to softball after high school, but I did play over 40 league baseball for a couple of years. And that was hmm. pretty tough, but that's after I had, uh, some major surgeries on my knees, but, um, I wanted to get into a hobby since I couldn't really golf anymore. I only got about 15% bend in both elbows now. So I couldn't golf and that I used to play a lot of golf. I played in high school and, uh, you know, we had some money games during the week and, uh, I just couldn't do it. I had to give it up. So, uh, back in the early seventies, back in Cub Scouts, our den leader, you know, we had like electronic segments and stuff like that, where we build stuff and we put together an old Heath kit, uh, metal detector. It was green. I remember it. And then when we go on camping trips, for the weekend, which I don't even know if they do that kind of stuff anymore without parents, but we'd go on like 10 mile hikes and such, such like that. But when we camp out, we'd always take that detector to any campgrounds that we went to and we used it. And I, so I kind of understood it. I, I, you know, I kind of liked it. And then, uh, I decided to get back in the hobby just cause I, I knew so many people in Des Moines area, you know, Des Moines pretty big, mm-hmm. about 700,000 people, but I lived on both sides of town, you know, and, and being in the scouts and I was in junior achievement and everything else, paper boy, um, I got to meet a lot of people. So two, two major neighborhoods where I grew up when I was young. So I decided to get back into it, um, right before 2000, uh, year 2000, probably nine, 1999. So you uh, went from swinging baseball bats and golf clubs to swinging a detector again. Yeah, and I started with a couple white machines. Uh, I think one was a coin master. And later on in between machines, I bought the new MX Sport. I tried it for about a week, tested it, and uh, ended up buying a Deus right after that. But I ran to Soro for years. And uh, found a lot of good, a lot, of, a lot of really good finds with the Tesoro. Hmm. That's no surprise. We see you a lot on film and film and camera work. Is that your kind of thing, right? Um, it is now. I work for Ryan. Um, it's a seasonal job. It's seven months out of the year, and we and he's the TV producer at a racetrack called Prairie Meadow. So um, we actually have a TV show Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. And then when there's special race days, um, actually we have uh, a wiener dog race coming up uh, <laughs> uh, for the day after Father's Day next week. And um, we have like uh, 
Oh, just all kinds of weird animals like uh, ostrich, uh, zebra racing, camel racing events. Mm-hmm. But our our main thing are, you know, we start the season with thoroughbreds and, and then we go to uh, quarter horses later on in the season and finish up in October. So I start in May and, and end up finishing in October. We have about 20 people in our t- television production every night and i run one of the main cameras ryan runs a main camera also but you know he's in charge of everybody so it's um so yeah i run a very expensive sony camera i'm in i'm on the top floor i call it the birdhouse and it's a big giant window it's kind of like on a lazy susan and this camera's mounted on a platform and i stand up and i do a post parade feature I run a robotic PTZ camera Um, when they introduce the horses. And during the the show, we have a live uh, MC that picks the, you know, one through four on the, on each race. And then we get close ups of the horse, the jockeys, and then, you know, all the way up to where they take out of the gate to the finish line. So um, it's, it's a pretty neat process, but most of our races are about 10, 10 races long per night. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm guessing that filming for work differs from filming for metal detecting. Um, in you know, I I try to film everything when I'm out digging and stuff like that. For people like me who aren't necessarily professionals at it, what tips do you have to make a good YouTube video? Well, they're always they're always improving, Grant. I'm always trying to improve myself. Um, mm-hmm. I always tried to rush you know, the setting and, 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 you know, moving left to right. And I was always going too fast and you have to capture that more of a slower process. You can always speed it up in the editing, but, or slow it down, but you got to get, get it focused. That's the main thing. You, you have to be in focus and have the right lighting, but I've tried all kinds of, you know, uh, Chinese, Japanese type, cameras in the past you know when i was into rc stuff you know uh airplanes you know quadcopters and stuff like that and started getting interested in stuff like that but actually i just bought a new one it's it's kind of like what you got and um it's working out fairly well ryan bought one and Mm -hmm. we've been recording some stuff on it and it's doing a real good job we haven't posted any of the videos that we've done yet but i've got probably uh i don't know maybe 10 hours on mine and it's working really good but um it's hard to do it by yourself that's for sure you might have to have multiple cameras but when i started learning about the dais i needed something that was light for the you know the difficulty i have in my elbows um and uh the dais was fully adjustable in the length that i needed the angle that i needed and the lightness i swung an e-track for a while it killed my elbow it killed my shoulder i'm not saying it was a bad detector but it just was so heavy Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. then i'm glad that i i found the dais but yeah, as you know as well as I do, all all the cameras are changing. It's they're getting better and better, you know, every day. Yeah, and I think you brought something up that's important, and that's it's hard to do when you're by yourself. I think people who don't film don't appreciate how much work it really is, both the filming and the editing. Oh yeah, it's it's really tough. Um, Ryan does most of my editing for me, and Dave, our our captain, Dina Telly over in Wisconsin, has done some editing for me. But hey, guess who just bought? a great editing program and it's going to start doing it themselves. That's me. Oh, so sure. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get on board with it and try to take the load off of Ryan. He's busy at work, let alone trying to do stuff for XP. What's the future have in store for the XP team USA YouTube channel? Well, I started the podcast with you, David, and I, I talked to some few, few of our members and, you know, our, our captain, Dave D and he kind of needed some help of keeping Facebook, you know, going. And I told him that, you know, it was probably time for me to kind of move on and I'd do whatever I could to get our numbers up on Facebook and YouTube. And, uh, of course, Gary Blackwell wanted 
you know, us to do more on YouTube, and then he would definitely help us in any way because he's, he's done so much great videos over the years. That's how I learned about the day. It was through Gary and um, just mostly short stories, you know, nothing boring, um, not like a main feature, but, you know, maybe one to two minute clips and maybe we'll put three or four of them together. And, you know, it's it's kind of exciting, but still a little bit little bit educational for people to watch mm. yeah I, I i certainly enjoy them and i think our our uh, followers on facebook enjoy them too um because you are sort of the wise old owl on our team and you do get out to detect more often than most people um you know how do you feel about that position on our team and and how do you actually get out so much <laughs> Yeah, I I do. I try to go as much as I can physically. Um, I do have, I had some problems in 2008. I had uh, two DVTs within a week apart in my left leg. And um, that's the leg I've had three knee surgeries with an ACL replacement. And what it did is it, it damaged the return vein. There's like a little valve in that main return line back to my heart and it damaged that. So, um, of course I had to see a hematologist and they did all kinds of blood tests on me for a week. And it came back that I had factor five, which is a hereditary, um, blood clotting disorder. And I actually got that from my father. He drove for Greyhound bus lines for years and, um, he had blood clots. So basically it came down. I had to have my whole family tested and all my children came up with factor five. So the, the girl, Girls in my in my family have to be very cautious, you know, during pregnancy and birth control, so on and so forth, and possibly take blood thinners. But um, that happened in uh, 2008, and I went through the, you know, whatever I had to do. I, you know, I'm taking I call it rat poison, but it's it's warfarin. It's a blood thinner, and it's not going to solve 100% of my problems. It's just a preventative in case I have a blood clot. But every time I have a surgery, they, you know, I have to uh, monitor it really close because, you know, the blood's a lot thinner than a normal, normal person. But uh, 2010, you guys, I, I had a, a, a stroke and that went in for more testing about that. And they did all kinds of nerve testing. I ended up having just tons of nerve damage in my hands and elbows and, you know, tons of arthritis in my knees and elbows. And it was uh, non-reversible. So I'm kind of living with that. So I ended up going to a mediation, a mediation type of place with government doctors. They did a full evaluation in about five hours one day. And then I had to go before a court. So they put me on a partial disability because they said the work that I've done in the past is more or less kind of like a mechanical type position where I work with my hands. And since my hands go numb so fast, they fall asleep that I needed a new career of what I could handle, you know, for me. So um, 2010 is kind of the magical date when I turned 50. So um, that's when I started taking seasonal jobs. So I started working for, you know, Ryan at the racetrack. And then I plow snow for a bunch of uh, retired police officers here in the town that I live in. So I do that all winter. And um, that's how I have so much time because most of my, the appointments are scheduled um, at certain times. So I can go out quite a bit. So a lot of door knocking, a lot of old neighbors. I go back to the old neighborhoods and I usually get permissions pretty easy. So I just find it fascinating to find and dig up old history and, you know, learn about it. And, you know, it's a, it's a great hobby for someone that wants to get into it. Oh yeah. And do you find your day is a lot easier on you than any of your previous machines? Oh yeah. It's just, you know, the, it's so easy to pivot the head of the coil and, and the length can be so adjustable for my arm that, you know, and, and two pounds of weight is nothing. So it doesn't hurt the angle of my elbow at all. It, it, I don't get any soreness. And I was healthier when I swung the E-Track, but it just really was way too heavy of a machine. Mm. So I'm glad I found, you know, XP out there and I can't look back, you know, it's just something I'll always stay with until, you know, I'm finally done, which I don't expect to be too soon, but going back to the, the old goat of the team, Grant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, I always wondered if Dave and I were close, you know, in age, 
And I looked him up, and by God, he's six months younger. So I am the old. I am the owl. I am the old owl on the team. Believe it or not. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, and I'll tell you, I've got healthy shoulders, and I've swung heavier machines, and I feel like they're going to fall off at the end of the day. So um, I think you are very wise to have uh, switched over to XP. <laughs> so you hunt a variety of sites in Iowa, and one of the more intriguing ones is the Enterprise Mine. How did you get permission there, and what's that overall experience been like? Um, I live a little bit rural area. Um, I'm a couple miles north of Des Moines, so I'm in the suburb, and uh, it's mostly, you know, all agricultural around here, mostly soybeans and, and corn crops, you know, some cattle and a lot of hogs. And I just end up meeting a lot of the farmers out here and most of their, you know, they most of them have signs on their front fence by the roads that say century old farm. But when you really get down in the nitty gritty and ask them how long it's been there, it's been there for five generations. So, mm. you know, you're looking anywhere from 150 to 170 year old farm that's been in the family. So, um, I always have access to rural areas and then, you know, being close to Des Moines and just knowing all the people on the east and west side, uh, I can always get into the city. But most of the older homes in the city are in, a, in pretty dangerous neighborhoods now. And I've taken Ryan down that way a lot a few times. We've had a lot of good luck, but um, I'm not saying all rural areas are perfect. They're not. A lot of people didn't have money back then. They they tell you stories of how they couldn't pay their taxes in the 40s or 30s, and they had to sell off, you know, a couple hundred acres or 500 acres. So, you know, there were some bad times around here, but Enterprise was... Um, a uh, place that I stumbled on. I used to vote over at the co-op. It, it used to be called Heartland Co-op. And we used to have our voting there, you know, every two or four years. That's where the wife and I would go vote. And I ended up meeting a, a, a older farmer and, and I, I noticed his mom still lived there. And she was um, 99 when I met her and she's still alive. And she told me about Enterprise being a rowdy, loud, drinking town. So I started researching it, and I ended up finding it on the plat maps, and I counted over, well, close to 200 homes there. And I ended up not – I knew the owner's name, but I never really met the owners. And then finally I just – you know, did a knock on the doors and talk to them, and they said to go for it. So I've been there for over a couple of years now. And drinkers are good for losing stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, there was <laughs> there were so many saloons and taverns and dance halls there, you know. Um, a lot of Maverick tokens where they would just list, you know, J&B Saloon or uh, TS uh, Pool Hall. or You know, there were so many of those tokens that I found there that, you know, people weren't paying state tax probably back then, and they were just under the table, but they actually had businesses there, believe it or not. And, you know, most of their tokens were five cents. I did find a few two and a half cents off drink uh, tokens there. But, um, yeah, I think the coal miners, what little money they did make, they, they probably spent it after they clocked out afterward. <laughs> Oh yeah. So, what are the, some of the cooler things you have found in the at Enterprise? Um, probably. Well, first of all, almost all the copper, anything that was copper there, has really got burned by the anhydrous um, that's used. Um, you know, they they spray you know chemicals, you know, insecticides, herbicides, so many times before and during plant growth there, and. Um, it just totally eats copper. Silver stays good. Brass stays good. Aluminum, you guys know as well as I do, aluminum gets kind of icky even in good soil. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I say I, probably my favorite finds there um, are personalized miner tags. I found some from Colorado there where someone guy worked at a place that had 5,000 miners, and I read up on the the place in Colorado where they went on strike and there were killings. And, you know, after it shut down, this guy, you know, probably traveled here and went to work there, but personal items there mean a lot to me. Um, now the machine made tokens, they're not, those machines aren't supposed to go back to any earlier than like 1938. 
you know, they kind of look like a star. They're about the size of a half, uh, silver dollar. They're aluminum. But we found quite a few with names, dates, birthdays on them. So it could be something that, you know, their, their sibling, I mean, their uh, children made later on, you know, and wanted something from their dad that worked there that died recently or whatever. But anything personal are, are my favorite finds there for sure. Do you have any clue as to how many different types of tokens you found at Enterprise? Um, I know that there's probably been 15 that's been added to the token catalog since I've hmm. posted a lot on the, the token uh web page u.s token web page on facebook um john much and a few other guys have put them in the book for me um just because you know i didn't take the time to sign up for an account and i really didn't have time to put them in there but i'd clean them up enough and give them dimensions where they would enter them and then put my name as you know the finder in enterprise iowa but um what they told me, anything that I find there as a token is probably the first and the last that they'll anybody will ever see, hmm. you know, because most of those, you know, establishments are long gone. They never reopened ever again. But there, there were a lot of Des Moines tokens from there that I tracked back. But I would say, you know, maybe over 100 tokens and different tokens, you know, maybe... 75 of them might have been different, close to 75. Wow. Wow. Yeah, That's quite a few. Cool. Yep. Yeah, I love fine tokens. So yeah, I... tokens are, you know, they, they've been around for a long time. You know, they people, you know, the the owner would off, you know, they'd want the repeat business from the customer. So they would offer, you know, five cents or t 10 cents, you know, mm -hmm. come back to my place and uh, get the discount. They wanted their business. So I, I, I think they just made them in mass quantities and, you know, had their names stay. I don't know what they cost them back then. Probably not much, but we found this one guy there. We found probably 20 of his tokens there. So I don't know if wow. the people in the town didn't care for the guy and threw him, you know, threw him on the ground or, <laughs> or he just gave a lot of them away. You know, yeah. who knows? Here in Oklahoma, we got a uh, token book and it's like a size of a phone book. And there's certain tokens on there that it has values on that are very rare. You try to go to these old ghost towns and try to find them tokens because they're worth they're worth a lot of money. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know what the value would be. I mean, I've, I got probably 15 of them right now. I'm trying to find, you know, four generations, you know, a, a great, great grandchild from the business owner from the late 1800s. I'm trying to find somebody to return them to, and it's so hard. I have a few people that have, you know, accounts with Ancestry.com, and it's just it's just a really hard process to find any relatives that are living anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to return a few to the you know the kids and the family eventually we'll be right back with lenny quaylen right after this XP has introduced its new ORX machine, a high-end machine at a mid-range price. The ORX has four factory preset programs, two gold, two coins, also two user programs. The ORX comes with a high-frequency coil and is compatible with the X35 coils. The ORX is now available in the USA. And we're back with Lenny Quaylen. We'd like to remind everyone to check out Metal Detecting Discovering the Lost Town on our XP Team USA YouTube channel for the feature video on the Enterprise history and some of the artifacts found. You also like to detect your fair share of home sites. So what are some of the cool finds that you have found on uh, home sites? Um, probably, well, you know, we've done, we've done some good ones, you know, popular people in the twenties and thirties here in Des Moines, um, their home sites turned out to be really good, you know, uh, personalized luggage tags, you know, with dates, of you know, people that were vice president of like, you know, United or Braniff or something airlines, um, um, just a few famous people around Des Moines, uh, druggists, pharmacists, uh, you know, uh, chain, uh, grocery store uh, owners at one time, but the coins are always good in the city. Um, a lot of watch fobs, a lot of tokens and 
Um, I can't tell you one house is better than the other. I, I like to hit two story homes um, just because probably they had uh, kids. And, you know, you, your chances are a lot better than hitting a, a ranch or a, a small two bedroom brick at home, you know, that was built in 1915 or 1920. The guy could have been an accountant or he just mowed once a week, you know. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't married, you know, he didn't lose nothing, you know. And then there's some places that you'd think that are be so great and they didn't have nothing to lose guys i mean they were that tight i mean there mm -hmm. there were chores to do you do your school work you know you go to church on sunday and you know homework you know and that was it they didn't have an allowance they they didn't have any money to lose or nothing mm -hmm. to lose so sometimes you run into stuff like that's a chance you take so I, you can't really call something just because it looks good you know what i mean yep Yep, hundred <laughs> um, percent. And you've actually been using the ORX quite a bit lately. Um, how do you like that detector? I think it's really a good detector. Um, compared with the Deus, it's simpler. Um, I dig a lot more, like I did with you know my Tesoro. Um, I am a VDI watcher, um, just because I know the Deus so well on on numbers, especially on coins and rings and such, that uh, you're only working with three tones on the ORX. So I'm digging more, you know, in the medium tones. Um, you know, a lot of tokens come in the 80s. Um, you know, Indian heads are still there. You know, all the silver is a high tone on the ORX. So you just about want to dig everything on a high tone on the ORX. And the medium tones, you know, you got buttons and stuff like that that come in. And, and you know, even gold coins will come in on the medium tone. So, you know, you're going to learn. You're going to dig more. I think with the ORX, you're not going to miss as much. Um, and while you're there, you know, you might as well dig as much as you can anyway. Um, I try to look. You know, when I go to an older property, if I if I'm not, I went out with Ryan today, and I was tired, and I didn't. You know, I always tell everybody I'm a I'm a hundred plug digger a day. That's it. I do a hundred mm -hmm. plugs, and I'm done. I, I just I don't want to do anymore. It's too hard on me physically. Um, but you, you know, you, you should be digging a lot, especially if you're new. But like I said, the ORX. I mean, it everything's wireless still it's light it's you know it, it has all the different frequencies you can choose from and you're going to dig more stuff you really are you're forced to almost dig a, dig a lot of stuff if you never swing the dais because you're not familiar with vdis yet and you'll learn that on the orx but what i'm saying is um you know i've had guys ask me to you know put the put the menu in for orx on my dais and i have hmm. Help them set it up the same way because yeah. they think it's so simple. You know, guys that run full tones out east, you know, that is a lot of different tones. I mean, mm -hmm. once someone gets to know the dais, you know, you know, you hear so much, you know, tell me a good program to use, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, if, if they studied the dais a little more, read a little more, watched a little more instructional video from Gary, um, they would laugh at that question they asked me because the machine is so simple. You run it, you tell it what you want to find. I mean, that's basically what you're doing. You need more depth, you got it right there. You know, mm -hmm. you, you need more reactivity, you need more speed in the reactivity because you're in the front yard, you're by the front stoop of a house, and you're here in target, 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 but you're trying to listen for a fainter target because you don't want to search the first 50 years of coin drops. You want to find something that got dropped 80 or 90 years ago. You want to be able to know the difference in that in that in the tone and and know the depth by how loud it is on the tone. Um, it, it's very simple to operate. You know, we went to a yard today. It was our last yard, and I found some surface roses. And you guys might laugh, but I was tired. And Ryan found two bucket lists. Well, one bucket list here, but two of them, which, you know, how much better could that be? He found two sterling silver spoons, first time ever. He hmm. found two of them. One's British. Um, so we weighed them 68 grams for on uh, both spoons together on my scale. Wow. So, you know, I don't know, that comes out to, I don't know, 25 bucks or something, melt value or something like that, or maybe 20. I don't even, I can't remember, but they're beautiful spoons. And what was I doing? Well, I took some rose bushes because they were going to get bulldozed over anyway. So <laughs> I grabbed about 10 rose bushes and I came home and transplanted them. But 
I did go through the front yard and I was looking for just something deep, something deep only. And I hit junk, you know, like you will sometimes, but was I discouraged? No, I, I had enough for today. But, you know, when you're on a roll, you know, you guys know as well as I do, you know, if you're in a good yard, you'll get, you'll get more than a hundred plugs done if you start hitting some good stuff. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's exhausting work. <laughs> and you said digging a hundred holes. I mean, yeah, I can relate. So l- let me ask you this. So digging in the yep. dirt, getting your hands all dirty. How does that conflict with you being a germaphobe? We heard that you go through your fair share of Purell. <laughs> That's at work. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm, humans scare me more than insects. You know what I mean? Um, well, yeah, you got to be cautious. I mean, I wear gloves, of course. You, you should wear gloves. I, I, I had a permission one time. It was rural. I went down about eight inches, and I hit, hit one of those broad tipped arrows with four ra- three or four razor blades on the arrow oh, yeah. Yeah. so mm. that arrow went missed a deer or maybe went through a deer and it went down on the ground you know the stick was gone rotted and that thing would have gashed me and you know me being on warfin i could have pulled mm. that out you know they, they couldn't have got me to the hospital fast enough but you should always wear gloves but yeah okay the 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 gel Pure X or whatever you want to call, there's so many of them. I think I buy a Walmart brand, but Germex. Yeah, I touch a lot of controls at work, and mm-hmm. you know, you know how it is: keyboards on computers, doorknobs, and everything. Yeah, I, I use it. We use fingerprinting, you know, for all the rooms we got to get into at the racetrack. And darn right, you know, you, you just <laughs> never know what you're gonna, you, you don't know what you're gonna pick up. So right. everybody uses my 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 Germex at work, and I usually, I think it's huge. I think. It's like a 20 ounce container of it. <laughs> and they asked me, they asked me the other day, Where, where's your Germex? And I said, you guys need to buy one. I bought them <laughs> the past couple of years, but yeah, I do wash my hands a lot and um, I don't want any germs. You know, that's me. Yeah, well, by <laughs> contrast, we hear that you don't exactly put the cleanest things in your belly either. You have a quite a fondness for McDonald's breakfast sandwiches. Is that right? Oh no. Um, I kind of got hooked on, um, it's not even that good, but biscuits <laughs> and gravy at McDonald's, um, you know, you get that and you get that, the large Coke's only a dollar now, so I can get out of there for 402 with tax, um, and, and they know I'm coming. I always <laughs> do the same thing every time when I go, oh, you know, Lynn's here, get, you know, and they, and they make it for, you know, it's fresh and it's. It's it's not bad, but we have a Casey's, a big large chain of Casey's, and there there's a little more uh, seasoned. It's a little it's a little spicier than uh, McDonald's, but no, I don't eat there every day. No, not every day. It's really fattening stuff. But you know, you got to get that stuff you know sticking to your ribs before you go out hunting. <laughs> yeah, and RC also tells us that um, we should buy stock in the uh, makers of Salisbury steak dinners. Um, you know, the frozen ones, <laughs> frozen on the center. Um, Boiling oh, on no. the outside. <laughs> oh my! Yeah, you know when everybody goes to work, they they complain about spending seven dollars for a meal at the racetrack. You know, you get the hamburger, some steak fries, and that's it. Well, you know, I'm always trying to save a little money here and there. So um, Walmart, you know, I'll give you a tip from your uncle Lynn. They got <laughs> hungry man dinners for dollar eighty three. Wow. You know, no no tax, but you can get the Salisbury steak. I, I had the chicken, the sl- sliced chicken with the mashed potatoes and the gravy and a cranberry and applesauce for the dessert and, and a, a mixed veg- vegetable, which I give a, another uh, robotic camera operator. He always eats my veggies. But, you know, how can you beat it, Grant, for $1.83, you know? Yeah. It's pretty cheap. <laughs> yeah. We obviously got this great intel from R.C. Dunn. So what's it like having him as a detecting partner, a filming buddy, and a colleague? Um, Ryan is a great guy. He's he's very patient, um, unless you don't do what he tells you. Um, <laughs> no, there's not really anything. We're not competitive, really. Maybe he thinks he is, but 
I'm not competitive with nobody going out. I hope for the best for either anybody that goes out metal detecting. Um, you know, he beats beats me up sometimes, and you know, I'll tell everybody that he beat me up that day. I'm not I'm not scared to say that, but um, I think he gets mad. Like if he does a front yard, what we usually do is we'll jump out of the car, and I'll say, "You want left or right of the sidewalk?" And he'll say, and then we'll alternate. Which don't you think that's fair? Each time we make a trip to the next house, we mm-hmm. you know we we alternate sides. Well. By the time I'm even done with my half, he's going around the side and into the backyard. <laughs> I go, I go back over his stuff. Where, and where'd you find that? Well, right there. Well, I already did that all. So um, it, it's hap- it's happened a few times, but it's it's no, it's no big deal. I mean, he, he's a great guy to work for. He's very patient. You know, the show's got to be done right. And, you know, he's, uh, he put it this way. He's a, he's very polite when he's sarcastic to me. How's that? <laughs> right. But no, he's, he's a great friend. He would help me out at any given time. And I've helped him out in jams and he's helped me out many times. He's just a pleasure to be around. He's a great guy, great family man, great coworker and great, great hunting partner. Yeah. It's, it's great to have a friend like that. Um, you know, that's a treasure in and of itself. Um, so what can we expect uh, in some of your future Facebook live broadcasts? Anything coming up? Well, I got some funny stuff coming. Um, and it might not even be about metal detecting. It might mm-hmm. be, you know, a, a store owner that's been, you know, in the family for 150 years. Uh, it might be anything. It might be a guy working on the railroad here in town. It might be, I might visit a hog ranch. I might, you know, go to the co-op and show you the price of soybeans and corn that day and how they uh the farmers drop it off and how it gets into the storing bins and how it's dried i don't know i might miss uh visit a couple colleges um and talk to them about certain things i might go hmm. see our big john deere plant and see if we can get any secrets like as you as you know as well as i do when it's muddy out, how that mud sticks to your shovels, I might see what their secrets are on why their disc on their on their tractors. Why how come mud doesn't stick? I want to know. Mm. I'm just gonna see what you know what what will help us guys in the yeah. future. You know, that's what it's all about. Help each other. So, are you planning to do any uh, traveling and detecting outside of Iowa? Uh, well, I, I I really would like to um, the detecting the heartland. I was going to try to go, but like I told you before, if I leave and Ryan's not at work also up through October, it's really super hard, especially when we had, you know, three big racetrack days, you know, um, he did get to go. I said, you go, we both can't go. And, um, there's a big hunt that, um, it's in Southern Wisconsin. And I know that I don't, I don't know if Tim's coming, but, uh, Sonia's coming, uh, Dave will be there. And then Jim and Alan from Minnesota will be there and Ryan's going. So we'll represent XP really good. And, and that's a big hunt in, in Southern Wisconsin. I can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. Um, but Jim and Alan just got back from a North Dakota one way up North, North of Fargo. And they had a good time and they gave away some XP shirts and hats and um, threw some uh, XP tokens out for the seated hunt and gave away a pinpointer and I, maybe a coil. I can't remember for sure the, all their prizes, but they had a good time. So they're going to be at the Southern Wisconsin one. So I guess right now what Dave, D, myself, Ryan, Alan, and Jim, we're putting together, we're going to do a water hunt. And yeah, mm. the, the fat man right here sitting is going to get in the water. <laughs> and basically we're going to meet at a halfway spot between, you know, middle of Iowa and, and upper Minnesota, where we can stay for the whole weekend and, and do some really good video on those guys from up north water detecting. And then me and Dave D will probably, you know, be on a raft or something trying to reach <laughs> with our detectors <laughs> into the sand and say, hey, Ryan, come and dig this for us. But no, I don't want to see any, any Speedos or nothing like that on our scene. <laughs> well, not- I think you just invited him to put one on. <laughs> oh my! But um, 
as far as the, uh, I think, Grant, you're going to the New York hunt, right? Or is it Rhode Island? It's New York, uh, pound the ground and uh, the Adirondacks. So that's oh, that's in October. I'm really looking forward to that. That that will be fun. That will mm-hmm. be good. And I think Spanya's going and Dave and maybe Gary, Gary Blackwell, right? I did hear Gary may fly across the pond for this one. So that would be really cool. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I traveled so much in my lifetime. You know, I, I was in the, you know, 12 volt in- industry most of my life. And then I went into auto air conditioning. So I, I lived in California for four years and I just traveled and drove so much. I, I just hate commuting. I hate driving. I hate flying. I don't sleep <laughs> well in motels. So I would probably be a wreck even if the place was only an hour away from here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I get it. I'm <laughs> the same way. Uh, I pack my own pillow these days just because the hotel pillows now, they're like 20 inches thick. I don't know how anyone can sleep on those things. <laughs> Yeah, I, the motels, I, I just, I, you know, if I stayed there for maybe a week, I, I'd probably get used to stuff. But, you know, the food's different, you know, the noises, the, you know, walking up and down the hallways and all that's so completely different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, w- with all the good stuff in your finds bag, uh, what's top in your bucket list these days? What are you really hoping to find? Well, I only had two things left that I needed. Um, I wanted to find a Derringer. Or an old 38 or, a, you know, boot gun or something at Enterprise. I know they're there. And I did. I Well, it wasn't a pistol. It was a rifle. And I can't remember the name of it. I put it on ID me. And right now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going through electrolysis on with white vinegar, of course. And I've put some steel brushing to it and doing it really slow. Um, it's like an 1880 or 1882 walking bash or walking bush mm. rifle it's a 22 caliber so it, it's the frame of the of the 22 rifle minus the barrel and of course the stock is rotted right but but some guy id'd that for me and so i did photos side by side because i found a couple of them online so i did find a firearm that is actually real and quite rare, but you hmm. know, it's you know, it's kind of beat up, of course. And then I, I suppose a gold coin. You know, I, I, you know, I went to all the trouble to go to our local, you know, couple coin dealers, and the guy was nice enough, and I did all the VDI numbers, you mm-hmm. know, on, uh-huh. on all the gold coin from a dollar up, and I got them all written down. So, you know, I just kind of know, you know, where they're going to fall in if they do, and I know they're they're at a few places where I'm going. You know, I bet I just, a lot of that's people. All, that's all I got. I mean, a lot of people will be interested in those numbers you got there. You gonna you gonna release some of those? Yeah, I could put the. I'll I'll post that. I I got them. Um, saved somewhere. Um, now this was before. I you know before uh like ORX they run you know in the program um ID normal. Um, I always ran or. ID normal under profile on the dais because I switch frequencies all the time yeah. with the low frequency coil. But so that, a lot of guys wouldn't run ID normal because <laughs> there was more separation in the VDI numbers on the um, graphic scale of not using ID normal. So but, you could really tell the difference between an Indian head and let's say a weak penny or a zinc mm-hmm. penny or a dye comes in. On ID normal, they're closer, but I switched frequency so much. I always knew the numbers so exact on ID normal. So that's, that's you know, but version, where I always stay. But version 5.2 don't have ID normal anymore, does it? No, it does not. No, it doesn't. But those numbers are encrypted in my head. You know, I just... <laughs> I just know them. Not that, not that I, I sit there and examine a plug, you know, before I dig it. I'm not like that. I don't sit there for three minutes going, should I do this or not? I just dig it anyway. But it kind of tells me if it's faint and it's, say, it's an 85 on the dais, you know, I'm thinking, oh, geez, could it could it be a zinc penny? Well, I know it's not a zinc penny because it, it you know, zinc penny would be shallower than what I'm hearing. So I'm going, you know, could it be... I know it's not a pure copper penny because they hit 
higher up on VDIs, but an Indian head, yeah, you know, right around there, 85 ish, but it's, you can tell it's two to three inches deeper most of the time. So those kind of numbers kind of are a telltale, you know, as long as the ground didn't, you know, get, uh, raked or added, you know, some topsoil to it or something like that, you're always pretty good, but you know, nothing here in Iowa is too deep. I mean, most of the large sense I find are three to four inches. That's it. That's all mm-hmm. the deeper stuff is like that here where i live so gold gold coin yes that's on my bucket list sir that's all i need and then i'll be happy forever awesome yeah so i gotta ask you lynn uh if you've gotten a one day free pass to metal detect anywhere that's always been off limits to metal detecting where would you hunt that's easy well first of all i would like a one day pass for two things i would like to be physically Hip top shape for that one day. Um, no pain, you know, 300 plug day. And I'd go back to the neighborhood where I grew up in when I, until I was 10 years old. There's 20, 20, 22, no, there's, uh, yeah, there's 11 houses on each side of us on the street. So there's 22 homes. I knew every person that lived there, the paper out there, I had Boy Scouts there. I sold them candy. I was in Jesus Achievement. I, you know, try to make things and sell them stuff. I'd like to do every one of those houses that where I first grew up at. Hmm. They're, they're all ni- early 1900s to 1920. Hmm. So that's what I, I'd like to do because I could say, hey, this uh, half dollar came from this guy's house. He was, you know, one to three kids there. He lost it, blah, blah, blah. It'd be a blast. Yeah, it'd be a nice trip down Mary Elaine, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, Lenny, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really, really enjoyed the conversation, and um, I'm pretty sure our listeners did too. Well, I appreciate it. You guys do a good job. Uh, I might not watch the podcast on time because I don't get off work till about 10, 15 every night. But um, I might listen to it, you know, the next morning, Saturday mornings, but I never miss it. I do miss the live comments, which are fun to see. We usually give, well, Dave's usually there. Doesn't he usually give away a few shirts maybe sometimes or half? He does now and then. Yeah, but you guys yeah. keep up the good work, and um, it's very entertaining, and you got great guests, and the product, the commercials, everything is uh, tip-top. Uh, top shelf stuff. I really enjoy it. It was great having you on and uh, miss you having you on. We'd like to have you on some more and uh, maybe have you as a regular guest sometimes. Yeah. You just uh, give me a ring and maybe by then I'll have my gold coin. How's that sound? Well, yeah. You can tell us <laughs> all about it. Sounds good. And if you guys are ever in Iowa and you want to go to an old coal mine town where there's plenty of empty whiskey bottles, you give me a call. Yeah. You got it. All Ooh, right. Thanks, Thanks Lenny. Bye-bye. Really we'll appreciate see. it. Bye. Bye. Check us out online at xpdais-usa.com. XP Metal Detectors now introduces the new X35 search coils designed around a brand new electronic advances. These new high performance and versatile coils will allow you to choose from a wide range of frequencies ranging from 3.7 kHz to 27.7 kHz. In total, there are 35 available frequencies based around five main frequencies that are quickly accessible. A new boost mode is now an option on frequencies 3.7 kHz to 4.4 kHz and can significantly increase detection depth on highly conductive targets such as large masses and large silver coins. The new X35 search coils will now be available as option as the same price as the previous coils and also now will be standard with the brand new Deus. So get your X35 today. All right, we're back. And that was great talking with Lenny. Yeah, I always enjoy talking to him. And he's uh, fortunate enough to be able to get out and detect quite often. And he's always posting pictures. Really keeps me motivated and makes me want to get out even more. And uh, XP Sonia has, is hosting another contest on our XP Team USA Facebook group page, the XP MI6 Pinpointer, courtesy of Metal Detectors America. So if you're interested in winning one, of those check them out yeah always great contests great opportunities to win an amazing product so uh, go to our facebook page look for the sticky post on how to enter be sure to check out our next show on june 28th we'll be talking to peter sorrell from new york he's our new xp team usa field rep out of new york and he's also helping to organize the pound the ground rally on the adirondack coast which is going to be a great hunt there's going to be a lot of us from xp team usa there yeah and 
Don't forget, also check out Beyond Sight and Sound with Josh Kimmel, Sundays and Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. He always puts on a great show, and again, his chat is always great, active, and entertaining. So yeah, please check him out. All right, and we will see y'all next time. Take care. Get that permission, put the coil to the soil, and we'll see you next time right here on the XP Team USA podcast. Mm-hmm.